I was asked to do a message today based on the fact that Zeal was here to talk about um, to talk about youth, to talk about children, to talk about that whole thing of parenting. So, so this is a, a message for for parents, for grandparents, for weird uncles, for for aunts, for for. Teenagers, for children. This is a message for everybody. And, and, and let me just say this. In this psalm, the, the writer declares one great overriding truth. And this is it. A life apart, a life without a real relationship with God, can never deliver as intended. Amen. It just can't. Nothing in life is ever what it's fully meant to be without the Lord in your life. Something's missing. Even good things, high points, blessings, successes, are never as satisfying and complete when he is absent from your life. The, the psalmist illustrates this in four prominent areas of life. And, and let me read the psalm. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchmen stay awake in vain. It's vain for you to rise early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives beloved sleep. And then he says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Four areas that, that occupy sort of the, the most of our time and most of our energy are, are mentioned in this song. Number one, the building of a house. Or, or let me say it this way. The establishing and the building of a home, the place you live, the place you retreat to, the place you find comfort in. Number two, the, the guarding of a city, which I would say personal safety, security, the ability and sense of saying, well, I'm okay, I can relax, I feel whole and complete. And then the occupation of of, of work or career, and it talks about rising early, sitting up late, no, no amount of hours or, or striving or worry or labor or pushing or working overtime can give you what God alone can add to your work and to your life. And then number four, the life with and or rearing or raising your children. Now, I had three little grandchildren over yesterday, and we have a trampoline in our backyard. I didn't want it, but Lynn pushed. <laughs> so we have it off in the corner, and they love getting on that thing. This is a six-year-old, five-year-old, and a two-year-old. And I said, before we, before we jump, they like to just lay there and let me jump while they're bouncing around like, like you know, popcorn or something. I said, before we do that, I want to ask you guys, we're going to play the smartest kid on the trampoline. They're like, what's that? Go, we're going to ask some Bible questions. They're like, okay. So I said, who was the guy who parted the Red Sea and all the Israelites went across to safety? Jesus! No, it wasn't Jesus. <laughs> Joseph! No, no, it's not Joseph. I go, what church do you guys go to? <laughs> I said, don't, don't they teach you anything there? They go, well, we don't really listen. I go, <laughs> I go okay. So, 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 so I, told, I told their mother. <laughs> but, but life with kids. The, the writer says, all are meant to be done in cooperation with the Lord. The building of a house. The, 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 the occupation, the, the guarding of the city, personal safety, and rearing of children, these, these things are all to be done with the Lord. 
and cooperation in order to, to bring blessing, satisfaction, which, which God designed also to come through your kids and into our lives. In, in this book of Psalms, the, the bulk of this one actually speaks more about children than anything, the rearing, the overseeing of those lives. And, and he put them in, into your home and into your heart and into your care. And, and even as a grandparent, you still have that influence. Now, the reason I believe the greatest focus here is given to children is that raising godly children, not just children who know God, but who understand they're called to serve God, Amen. That, that it's part of their life, it's part of who, who God intended them to be. This, this is one of the greatest challenges in life and one of the highest responsibilities of life. This psalm reminds us that no child can ever be what he or she was fully intended to be outside of a relationship with the Lord. And God's desire is that every child is to be raised in the knowledge and in the ways of the Lord. It shows us God's view of children, the potential of a child in your life, and the need of the parents, mom, dad, grandparents, whoever, to help fulfill their potential in life. Verse 3 begins by saying, Behold, it says, it says, in other words, pay attention, take a look. And it says, children are a heritage from the Lord. They're a reward. See, God, God's view of children is, is, is not just a responsibility, not just a tax write-off, but a gift, that which is good, a reward in your life. There in the verse, we, we see the word heritage, which means inheritance or, or even transference of wealth, that which is of great value has been graciously, graciously given or transferred to you. When the Lord blesses us with children, he's entrusting us with something of amazing value. In our culture today, we need to be reminded of that, that children are of great value. We must not let or allow our view of family or children to be determined or dictated by the way culture sees them. We have to be careful of being selfish and materialistic and independent and, and, and not having sound truth to pass along. No one can hope to raise a godly child without valid truth and without checking ourselves on being self-absorbed or self-centered. See, children, more than anything, if you're going to raise a godly child, cost you your time. They cost you your life. Standard of living constantly impact your personal space, your agenda. And be careful that career and status and lifestyle don't become more important than fulfilling the significant job, the call of raising a godly family. Now, you have to give your time, your giftings, your, your intellect, as opposed to being consumed with wealth, career, because many times it's looked down on. Raising children is hard work. It's time-consuming. It's costly, not, not just financially, but also in the area of your own personal pursuits. It'll cost you at times. So if top priority in life is money, stuff, personal significance, then being a godly mom or a dad and raising godly kids can become a cultural casualty if you're not careful. I'm not saying all who choose to not have kids are materialistic and selfish. Those choices are private matters between individuals between married couples, between them and the Lord. To have children, or how many, is a personal deal. I mean, look at, look at verse 5. It says, Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak 
with their enemies in the gate. So a quiver is, you know, where you put your arrows. For some, one child fills it up pretty fast. For some, it's six. For some, it's ten. It's a personal leading between you and the Lord. You've probably heard the story uh, that I've told about my son, Neil, when he called me up and said, Deb, we're pregnant with number six. I said, wow. What do you, are you going to do the L thing? Because he had Lily, Lucy, Layla, Liam, Leo. Anyone remember any other ones? <laughs> and then he was going to have another one. I said, are you going to do the L thing? He goes, yeah. I said, how about last? <laughs> he, he, go, <laughs> he goes, I don't know, Dad. We'll see. I go, Okay. But, but it's a personal thing. I, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a instructing and, and sharing and, 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 and living out biblical truth before your children. It's teaching them the difference between light and dark, between truth and lies, between compromise and what's right living. And before I got married, pre-kid life, I thought, why bother bringing kids into the world? They just take up so much time. They're messy. They're, they're, they're just, I mean, you want to bring them into this crazy world? And it's not like I had this deep primal need. The Spencer blood must continue. No, no, I didn't have that. But Lynn and I, we, we, we got married and we, we, we prayed. We brought our thoughts and ideas about life and marriage and children before the Lord and before his word. And he said things like, hey, children, our heritage is the fruit of the womb's a reward. God says they're a blessing. So, so we, have, we had three kids. The, the Jewish history here, there was a time, if you know the story, that the, the, you never know what your kids are going to do, what they'll become. I don't think my mom ever in her wildest dreams thought I would be a pastor growing up. I know she didn't. She was wondering if I'd even survive teenage. But think about kids. Think about in the time of slavery in Egypt when the Jews were held there captive by the Pharaoh and, and they were multiplying so rapidly that the Pharaoh said, hey, we're going to start taking out all the firstborn boys. We're just going to annihilate them. They're growing too fast. And this one couple, Amram and Jochebed, they hid their sons. And they devised a plan to protect him and instruct him. And he grew up to be the one God used to deliver the entire nation from slavery, Moses. He's just a little baby who had a death sentence on his life. Think about Noah growing up as a baby. I'm sure his parents had no idea. One day... God will use him to build an ark and fill it up with animals and his own family. And God's going to repopulate the whole earth through our son, Noah. Esther, who saved the Jewish race and stood before a king at the jeopardy of her own life because she was told, who knows that you weren't born for such a time as this? All the great men and women of our history those who formed the Constitution and led our nation to freedom, who fought heroically on battlefields, who gave scientific breakthroughs, the medicine, technology, were at one time just little runny-nosed kids, a heritage, a reward from the Lord, a blessing. So when your son or your daughter or your grandson or granddaughter sticks their dirty feet on your couch, not that that ever happens in our home. <laughs> Spills juice or milk on the table. Stands there with the refrigerator door open for hours. You're thinking, what in the world? <laughs> Spits up on your clothes. You, you just say this. Come here, you little reward, you little gift, you little, <laughs> you little heritage. You might say, say, John, you don't know my kids. I would have to say heritage, blessing, reward by faith. Oh, I get it. But God calls them rewards. 
God calls them gifts and blessings. And, and he shows their potential in, in family life. He, he, he says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Happy. Ch children bring a, a realm of happiness into your life that you could never experience without them. I remember the, 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 those first steps where you're trying to get the little kid to walk and, you know, they're, and they make that first step. And like, oh, my God, look, he's, he's walking. He can get a job. <laughs> Watching that child born and holding him for the first time or her in your arms for the first time. What an amazing experience that is. Having the first words, especially if it's dada. Any kid can say mama. But dada? Now that's a word. The, fir the first time they, they ride a bicycle, you watch them, you know, you're finally able to let them go, and they're, uh, they, they do it, and it's amazing. That, that, that first tooth they lose, and that big gap in their smile, and they're so proud of it, and they expect you to pay for it. <laughs> Put some money under the pillow. Who started that? That, that first day of school, that, that first home run, if you had a little boy or girl hits one over the fence, I'll never forget that experience. That first touchdown they run, or the first father-daughter Valentine dance that you take them to, the first job, the, the first time they drive a car, all these different things they, they bring into your life. And, and here's the thing about that, it goes by like lightning, doesn't it? Before you know it, you go, oh my goodness. But it's all priceless. You can't buy that stuff. The, the psalmist is so right when he, when he says uh, in this passage that, that behold, children are a heritage, the fruit of the womb is a reward, like our, our arrows in the hand of a warrior. And it says very clearly, verse 3, they are from the Lord. First and foremost, they belong to him. Secondarily, we get to be stewards over them. They're his. Trusted to us as stewards to raise, to guide his ways by his terms on his behalf. And a steward in the Bible is one who is assigned to do the work of the owner or the master according to his bidding and according to his rules, we're called to be faithful and obedient. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'll just read it to you. The apostle Paul says, let a man so consider us, Paul speaking of the leadership, the servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries. Moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful, faithful. It doesn't say that one be found to be the richest or the most educated or the most successful or the most well-known. He says the most important thing as a steward is just to be found faithful. Not the smartest, not the Martha Stewartist, not the coolest or the hippest, but obedient and faithful to the Lord. So we rest in his truth, his authority, his love. And, Lord, help me be faithful with those things you've placed in my hands. And the culture will try to tell you all kinds of things. Oh, you need to read this book. Follow this trend. Do this. Do that. You need to be real strict. You need to be real lenient. They need to go to a Christian school. No, they need to be homeschooled. No, they need to go to public school. No, they, you need to spank them. No, you need to reason with them. And on and on it goes. But I would say the most important thing is, what does this say about children and rearing children? L listen to him and listen to his word and, and pray and, and be a steward under his authority. No one knows better or has better plans for your child than the Lord. And he's given you all kinds of information about it. They belong to him first, and they're like arrows in your hand. Now, I've never fashioned a real arrow, but I'm sure in the context of this history, you didn't just go around and find a stick and put a point on it and some feathers and go, oh, this is a pretty good arrow. 
No, it had to be fashioned, it had to be shaped, it had to be formed. And that's true of children. A godly child, how many of you know this? A godly child doesn't just happen. They're shaped and they're fashioned. All children need instruction and warning and discipline and encouragement and love and forgiveness. And you have to say, okay, I'm going to, God's placed this arrow in my hand and he, he's expecting me as a good steward, as a faithful one, to help fashion and shape it according to his rules, according to his heart, according to his guidance in my life. Every one of us required it. Every child is fashioned and shepherded and formed by something or someone before they enter adulthood. No child enters adulthood or adult life without being fashioned somehow. And they can't be left to be shaped or fashioned and formed by themselves. They don't have the experience, the wisdom, maturity. They're, they're, they're kids. They're young. You don't want your children fashioned by the latest music or by the latest television show or video game or movies or by some internet cellular phone influencer. You are entrusted with their heart, with their mind, with their purity, and given God's word to help shape and fashion these arrows that God has placed in your quiver. What an amazing thing it is. You say, John, you don't know my kids. You don't know my situation. Well, listen, we all trust God. We all remember who he is and the power of his word and his spirit. Yeah, but John, your kids grew up perfect. Boy, can I tell you some stories. <laughs> we all got them, don't we? If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent. There's no such thing as, as an easy child. They may act like they're easy, but that means they're extremely sneaky. That's what I found out. <laughs> you have his truth. You have his authority. You, you, you have his, his heart to pour into their life, into your kids. And I'm not saying you walk around with a Bible and a pulpit. You know, kick open the door. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, you sinner. No. But what your kids feed their heart will come out in their life. Ask questions to your kids. You know, when my kids started getting a little older, I would create all these hypothetical situations. Hey, what would you do if you were in the car and this happened and da-da-da? Dad, that's not going to happen. I didn't say it would. It's just, what would you do? And then I'd give my two cents worth. Ask questions. Share devotions with your kids when they're small. Point out the enemy's lies. I always told my kids, hey, God has a plan for your life, but so does the enemy. We are not unaware of his devices, the scripture says. Re remind them of his lies and his traps and some things you walk through. We must fashion like arrows and aim them like arrows and point them in a direction. You don't just shoot an arrow up in the sky hoping it'll hit a target. You know, growing up from about 13 years old to about 17 years old, I had a single mom who at times worked two jobs. And she wasn't around a lot, but she had this lady who would come clean the house. And she also did, maybe some of you are old enough to remember this, she did this thing called ironing. Anybody remember that? She would iron sometimes. And I, I would bring friends home sometimes from school, and she would give her feedback about my friends. And one time she said this about a guy I brought home. She said, nobody raised that boy. Nobody gave that boy any direction. I go, what do you mean? She said, he just growed. That's all he did. He just ate and growed. <laughs> How many of us grew up without any idea of what life was about, our relationship with the Lord looked like? I did. I grew up with no idea. To, to know the truth and the relationship. 
You're, 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 you're fashioning, you're, you're shaping an arrow. And, and the arrow's to be pointed at a specific target. And here's the target you want to hit. Not money, not that money's bad. Not necessarily, oh, they got to have the best education. Not that that's bad, or, or fame or success. But, but the, the bullseye would be seek first the kingdom of God. Point them towards a real living relationship with their own personal testimony of accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and walking with God. And you've hit the target. In humility and obedience, that's the target you want to hit. When, when I do baby dedications, and now I'm so old, I'm dedicating babies of babies I dedicated. I've had people come up to me and say, hey, would you dedicate my baby? You dedicated me. I'm like, really? You're old. But when I dedicate a baby, you know, and, I, and, and we were up here, we're all standing, I have a little baby in my arms. I don't say, Lord, by the time this child is 19, would you make him or her a multimillionaire? No, that's not something I usually pray. Or make them famous, give them their own talk show or podcast. Or, Lord, make sure they have amazing trips and, and fancy cars. My, my number one prayer is usually this, Lord, as early as possible. May they come to know you and walk with you and be led by you and have a personal relationship with you because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. That's what you want. Well-fashioned, well-aimed. Ch children are a blessing. They're, they're a reward. They're an inheritance. There's God's gift. And they have potential to bring happiness and joy into your home. And parents are called to help fashion and form and aim them. Of course, we know there's no such thing as a perfect parent. And we all blow it. I blew it over and over again. And I asked forgiveness. I started over from the Lord and the kids. You might say, well, John, I, I did everything right. And the kids, well, they're, they're a heartbreak. Decisions they've made, things they've done. To that I can only say, keep praying. Keep praying. Think of all the people that are here right now that were boneheads and made terrible decisions when you were growing up. Amen. I did. I was a total bonehead. But, but the story's not over for your kids, so as long as they're alive, you pray. And you ask God to intercede. Or you may say, John, I am the rebellious kid. I had a Christian mom. Or you might say, I had a Christian dad. I, I rebelled. I broke my parents' heart. Well, God's always waiting for the prodigal to come home. He's always waiting. Or you might say, John, I had terrible parents. No direction. No counsel. No leadership. I was raised by that my grandparents, or my dad was a drug addict, or I was raised in the woods by wolves, John. You don't know what it was like. <laughs> if you're God's child here today, he'll be your father if you let him. But I'm grown. It's never too late. But you don't know the hurt, the rejection, the disappointment. He'll use it in your life if you let him in ways you would never expect, ways you never dreamed. I, I remember a long time ago, I started doing some outreaches in, in the city of Cork, Ireland. We went over there for about three or four years. And one year I was speaking, we went around, we passed out flyers to all these young Irish kids. We had musicians on the road, on the streets. We, we rented a, a, a big venue and brought in a hip-hop band. We gave away surfboards. We were just seeing a lot of Irish kids coming to the Lord. And I was supposed to speak one night in this venue. And I had a message all prepared, but I felt like the Lord said, John, just share your testimony. Uh, 
So I got up and I told a little bit about my story of dropping out of high school and how I had a very abusive dad, how he used to hit me and he hit my older brother, he hit my mom and she came to us when we were 13 and my, my dad, you never knew if he was going to come home happy or drunk or mean or whatever. He just lived in this kind of dread of, of him showing up at the door at night. So I just shared my story and I gave an altar call at the end for those who wanted to receive Christ. And all these young Irish kids came forward. I was shocked because predominantly they were mostly Catholic. And the little Irish grandmothers were trying to pull them back. Oh, you've been confirmed. You don't need this Jesus. And I'm like, <laughs> these ladies are pulling their kids away from the altar. And I asked one of the pastors later, I said, why do you think so many kids came forward? He goes, well, because your story is their story. All the Irish men go to the pub after work. They drink till they're completely soused, and they go home and they beat their kids and their wives, and it's just, it's a part of their culture. They all knew exactly what you were talking about. And when you shared how the Lord delivered you, he, he, what he delivered me from was an intense, I, I guess I would call it sense of getting ripped off. Like I went off to Bible college at a young age and, and I saw all these young men whose dads were pastors and deacons and all of this. And, and I kept thinking, God, you never, I, why didn't I have a good dad? And I'll never forget, it felt like the Lord said, John, your dad is not your enemy. He's a victim of the enemy. And you would be just like him if I hadn't saved you. And then God brought children into my life and a, and a wonderful wife. And, and I remember thinking, God, if I can do marriage and children well, I'm going to try my hardest. I, I read every Dobson book that was ever printed. We, we tried to do it right. And we, we, we had our ups and downs, our successes and failures. But, but listen to what the psalmist says. Children. They're a heritage from the Lord. The, the fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. Happy is a man or woman who has a quiver full of them. See, here's the thing. Please listen. Please tune in. It doesn't, doesn't matter here today if you're a young parent, an older parent, a, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle. God has given you an amazing window of influence into the lives of these people that he calls a heritage, that he calls a reward. And if they ever needed someone to help fashion and shape them and form them, and like Lucas was talking about, his parents you know, placed him in a place that would help guide and lead his life biblically. There is so much going on in our culture today that, that wants to impact, affect, and in many ways destroy your, your child. And God has given you their heart in your home, and you're called to steward them according to his word. Amen? Amen. So, so what a challenge. I mean, a uh, greater challenge I think has ever been before with all the internet and the cellular phones and all the stuff that the enemy is pushing into their lives. You need to be just as vigilant about bringing God's word, his truth, his boundaries, his grace, his love, his forgiveness in humility and in love. Because look what he's done for you. And now he's called you to shepherd these children so they might hit the target of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. See, here, here's, here's, no one's going to do it perfect, but here's the challenge. Let's do it the best we can. 